Hi, I'm Old Nurse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. And in this video, I want to talk a little bit about how, why, and in what ways languages and their lost relationships might be reconstructed even after a fairly long amount of time has passed since their last speaker died. Let's start with a fairly simple example. Most people are gonna use Romance languages for this because you can usually pick a word in Spanish or Italian and Portuguese, Romanian and French, say, and establish that they're all pretty similar in structure and must go back to a common ancestor, and lo and behold, we have that common ancestor, it's late vulgar Latin. But I'm going to use languages that I study professionally instead, the Germanic languages, and uh, in that instance, we are not always in the lucky position of having written remnants of their proto-language, their immediate shared ancestor. Uh, although sometimes we do in the form of very old runic inscriptions in the Elder Futhark alphabet. So let's consider the word for day in different Germanic languages. In the oldest Germanic language in which we have any significant written remains, Gothic, day is dax. In Old Norse, dagr. In Old High German, tak. In Old English, Day. Now notice right away that Gothic and Old Norse have an ending, an extra letter that you don't see in the Old English and Old High German. Whereas otherwise, all of these languages agree in having consonant, vowel, consonant. So the most reasonable thing to suppose right off the top is that it is Gothic and Old Norse that have kept something and Old English and Old High German that have lost something. This is mostly because it is overall more likely for languages to lose material than to gain it over time. That is not always the case. Languages do sometimes gain material. Uh, for example, right now in English, there are pairs of simple old roots and their extended versions in a couple prepositions. Uh, there's while versus whilst, amid versus amidst, among versus amongst. In each of those cases, the ST is actually a late addition to that word. Uh, and that might be winning out just because it seems like people think it sounds smarter to add the ST or sounds more British, which for a lot of people means the same thing. Um, but overall, languages tend to lose material more than they gain it over time. And since Gothic overall is the oldest of these in terms of attestation, of course, all languages are in principle uh, equally early. They all go back to uh, a, a long succession of natural spoken human languages that probably go back to the earliest time that Homo sapiens existed. Um, still, there are some that we have written much earlier than others. And Gothic is written down earlier than these others, at least in any sort of significant way. And so overall, uh, we ought to favor the older languages structure in reconstructing the ancestor of all of the languages, as that one is going to be closer to the point where all of these languages split off. All right. So it's also notable that if you look at the whole grammatical system of these languages, the word for day is not just used in this form. Now in modern English, we don't really have anything equivalent to this, except in the sense that we say day and days, plural, but we also have a possessive form, the day's events. We also have, uh, I think this is actually kind of going extinct, a, a plural possessive form, um, the day's events with days referring to multiple days. That actually seems to be getting rapidly replaced by events of the days. Um, people seem to only want to use the possessive with the singular anymore. Just a stray personal observation. And uh, so in these early Germanic languages, you do have a lot of endings that change. Uh, for instance, to make the plural in Old Norse, you go from dagr to dagar, but that's not the only plural form. That's the plural form if it's the subject, if days are passing. But if I stayed here many days, that would be daga. If I were to uh, be in the days of someone, that would be dogum. Uh, so these languages are inflected. They have different endings depending on the role that a noun has in 
the sentence relative to the verb and other nouns and prepositions. So notice, too, that if we look at the full paradigm that is the full uh, available grammatical forms of dax in Gothic and dagar in Old Norse, that that s and that r are always dropped before we add the other endings. So in Old Norse, to make the possessive singular form, genitive singular form, we don't say dagars, we say dax. So clearly the root of the word in that case is still dach, and the same in Gothic, just as it is um, probably underlying in Old High German and Old English. Now let's consider something else. So we have a root that's um, consonant, vowel, consonant. There is a uh, grammatical ending that is still there in Old Norse and in Gothic, but is lost in Old High German and Old English. So let's focus on the root here. Each one of these ends in a G. Now, in Old High German, we're fairly confident that that G is pronounced K in this position, uh, as it is in modern day German in the equivalent Tag, Day. But this is a rule of German that any consonant is, well, I mean, it's, it's more complicated than this, but basically uh, most consonants, certainly stop consonants, are de-voiced in final position. So at the end of a word, a G is going to become a K. But that G is going to reassert itself in the dative singular, even in modern German, as Tage. So underlyingly, this is still a G, even if in this particular position, it's articulated as a K. All right, so still, fundamentally, our root is now consonant vowel G, right? It is most reasonable to suppose that where the most languages agree, there you have the older form. So then probably the vowel in the uh, center of this is an A. In other words, the pronunciation A, of course, we don't call that A in English because our pronunciation of A has changed a lot since the great vowel shift, but that's another subject. So in Old English, we see that that A has changed to an A, but then if we look at other words in Old English where there is an A followed by a G, we also see this regular change of a uh, to a. Uh. So again, it's conditioned sound change. Once we can note that condition, it's no longer mysterious why Old English is different. We can dismiss that a uh, as a later form that developed from an earlier a. Uh. Notice too, my pronunciation of the G in Old English is uh, also to some extent based on modern English pronunciation. We generally believe that the G's after front vowels, which includes a, uh, uh, were pronounced as a y, so day being ancestral, of course, to English day. But the other languages show us that this was actually originally a uh, quote unquote harder consonant. In fact, probably not a, a stop g, a g, but probably a voiced velar fricative a g, so da being the original root. So that leaves us with the initial consonant, d or t. Well, three of the languages have d, Old High German has a t. Again, we see a condition sound change. At the beginning of words, Ds become Ts in Old High German, and that persists into modern German today, so that English words that start with D, their cognates in German will start with a T. So this gives us a proto-word Dag. We can assume proto-root of a word Dag. We can assume that this also had a grammatical ending in the nominative singular that's reflected in the Gothic S and the Old Norse R. Probably if we're just looking at this one word, we're not going to be able to guess what that is. But overall, we favor the S as being the original form of that nominative singular ending because that agrees with more Indo-European languages. And again, that is what we see in Gothic, which is the oldest of these languages with any consistent attestation. But in fact, in the earliest runic writing in Old Norse, well, what's ancestral to Norse, Proto-Norse, we see that S2, or, well, it's written as a, with a rune that, that probably tokens Z. So that gets us back to a proto-language, a language we're reconstructing that is ancestral, immediately ancestral, not distantly ancestral, but right at the point where these languages split that are actually attested in writing or speech, in this case, writing, because we have no recordings of people speaking Gothic in 300 or Old English in 700. So that kind of reconstruction, by comparing languages that are attested in speech or writing, gets us back to a proto-language, again, something immediately ancestral to those attested languages. We can also compare proto-languages 
uh, one level back, so we can take Proto-Germanic, compare that to Proto-Indic, the reconstructed ancestor of the Indo-European languages of India, compare that to Proto-Greek, Proto-Celtic, Proto-Slavic, etc., and get Proto-Indo-European. Now, Proto-Indo-European does not appear to be closely related to any other language families. I will not be surprised if during my lifetime someone demonstrates a, a clear link to Uralic or maybe Afroasiatic, but at this time, as I'm speaking in 2019, that's not been conclusively demonstrated. But if it is related to those other language families, that relationship is pretty far back. And one problem that you get into with trying to reconstruct too far back, trying to, to connect too many language families, is what I call, I'm not sure anybody else calls it this, but I call it the hamburger problem. Consider this. In English, you can say burger with just about anything, right? The original word is hamburger. That denoted a kind of sandwich with a meat patty in it, so not even ham, right? But now you can say, now this word burger is actually productive. You can just say burger, which typically implies hamburger. There's also cheeseburger, one with cheese, chicken burger, one with chicken, turkey burger, one that is turkey, um, instead of beef, uh, vegetable burger, etc. Now, this word, burger, is produced by taking off a part of a German word originally um, that looks like an English word, ham, but in fact has nothing to do with ham. Right? This is from this, the name of the city Hamburg in Germany, um, which has nothing to do with ham. It's, uh, you know, Burg means city. I'm not sure off the top of my head what the ham part means, but it doesn't mean ham. And, uh, you know, the, the sandwich doesn't even contain ham. I mean, it would actually be weird to have a hamburger that had ham in it. But since that word ham looks like a meat in English, um, that is taken off and the burger is seen as some kind of productive formant uh, or even its own independent morphine, its own word that just means some kind of sandwich, right? That has meat or, or some kind of substitute in it, like, like a mushroom or, or, or soy or something. Um, but that originally means one from a place, right? A Hamburger is someone who's from Hamburg, right? So somebody who, let's say 2,000 years in the future, is reading texts in English from the early 21st century, uh, but has no access to German, right? German has disappeared as many languages do over time. And, you know, hypothetically, let's say German has disappeared in this future, but there's still traces of English, uh, you know, in, in archeological sites, uh, but there's not any in, in, in what used to be Central Europe. Um, you know, someone would have no idea, perhaps, why this burger element just appeared out of nowhere in English and started to mean sandwich. And if they had no access to records of German, why on earth would they ever guess that this had come from another language and originally meant part of a word that meant someone from a particular city that originally this type of sandwich came from, right? It's absurd to even try to reconstruct that, but that's the true story. And so my guess is every century in every language, there's two or three or four burgers. And so the further back in time you go, the more of this hamburger problem you're going to get till eventually a language's entire vocabulary has probably been replaced over time. So I'm extremely skeptical of attempts to reconstruct a proto-world language because I think the hamburger problem has probably erased the relationships between uh, most language families, except maybe the very geographically um, most contiguous, but even then you get into the problem that if they're geographically so contiguous, do their, um, do, do their apparent relationships, if we can't demonstrate um, uh, consistent sound change laws, like with Grimm's Law within Indo-European, do their relationships actually reflect genetic relationship, or do they reflect centuries of hamburgering each other, right? Um, who knows? Uh, and I just think that's, that's, that's too dangerous. But you can within a reconstructed language, as long as that reconstructed language is known pretty well, like Proto-Indo-European is pretty well documentable based on uh, how close the congruences of the Proto-languages for the various Indo-European branches are. Uh, we have a pretty, pretty solid picture of what Indo-European looked like and sounded like, uh, and that's been pretty solid for the last hundred so or year, hundred or so years of scholarship in Indo-European. You can also do pre-languages, so you can get pre-Indo-European, and this is taking a proto-language, uh, the furthest back you can go with it, 
and then figuring out from the structure of that proto-language what earlier stages of that proto-language might have looked like. The most famous example of this in the European studies is the reconstruction of the laryngeals. Now, if you just take the earliest uh, 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 tested into European languages, if you're looking at Vedic Sanskrit, Homeric Greek, Archaic Latin, um, you don't necessarily, when you compare all of these, reconstruct a language uh, ancestral to them, Proto-Indo-European, that has uh, laryngeals. The laryngeals are famously discovered by comparing the structure of words and their forms in Proto-Indo-European itself by the linguist Ferdinand de Saussure. Now, Saussure's reasoning is really brilliant, and by the way, his work on this was published when he was 21. But I don't have time to go into it right here. It involves really getting into the nitty-gritty of the structure of verbs in languages like Vedic Sanskrit uh, and how they had arisen from the Proto-Indo-European system. But he postulated the existence of a special class of consonants that were actually lost in all known Indo-European languages at his time uh, to explain how uh, verb roots had, had, uh, had actually been consistently formed with regard to their endings in Proto-Indo-European. And so he reconstructed pre-Indo-European with this class of consonants, the laryngeals we call them, we're not actually sure they were laryngeals, um, that later, after he had died, were actually discovered in one attested Indo-European language, the most archaic, Hittite. So pre-languages can be reconstructed with some confidence as long as the proto-language is known, but you probably can't go back too, 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 too far, right? Pre-Indo-European might be 5,000 BC, maybe. Uh, I would be very nervous about going back much more than a couple thousand years beyond that, just because of, again, stuff like the hamburger problem, right? Now, let me note something else as far as reconstructing languages and their relationships. Every language, every human language, is working with a limited number of syllables and sounds. That means you're going to get words that sound the same in any given language. You can pick Zuni and Old Norse, and you can find stuff that sounds the same and means the same thing, or almost the same thing. People tend to get excited when they find words that look similar and mean similar things in two different languages, and they tend to construct these grand theories about how they're connected. But it's worth nothing if you don't have consistent sound change rules that explain it. Now, I'm linking in a card right now to my video about Grimm's Law, which explains one of the most famous consistent sound change rules in Indo-European. It really deserves its own um, video. But to be brief, notice when I was talking about reconstructing the Proto-Germanic word for day from Gothic Old Norse, um, Old High German and Old English, that, the, that, that I was explaining some changes in, say, Old High German by reference to changes that we see in every word in Old High German that has a given sound. We need that. We need that kind of consistent sound change to say these languages are related and it's not just a coincidence. Particularly in words that have onomatopoeic origins, potential onomatopoeic origins. The most famous example being that words for mother tend to have the syllable ma in them just because that's something babies make really early. Ma, ma, right? Similarly, a lot of words for animals like raven or crow often have uh, sounds in them that imitate the sound the animal makes. So words for raven or crow often have ka in them in uh, at least certain stages of a language's development. So, one thing to bear in mind there is if you discover two words in two related languages or unrelated languages that look similar, you've got to establish that there's actually a consistent relationship there, and you have to pay attention to what we know about the history of each one of those languages, as far as we know it. One of the most famous examples is Greek theos. I know I'm not pronouncing it exactly the classical Greek way, but that's how most people think of it today. And then Latin deus, both of which mean God, look pretty similar, but actually do not reflect um, uh, cognates, uh, do not reflect descendants from one word in Indo-European. They just, by coincidence, end up looking the same. One that I encounter a ton, people are always asking me about it, is Etruscan, um, probably not even, in, not even in Indo-European language, although some people suspect that it's like a really aberrant Anatolian language. It's a whole other subject. But Etruscan apparently has a word, Aesir, which means gods. In Old Norse, Asir means gods. I have heard a hundred times that this means that somehow um, Old Norse and Etruscan are related or that the, the gods are related. But Old Norse Asir, we can 
confidently say comes from Proto-Germanic ansees that R in Old Norse is consistently produced in plural forms like asir from a Z in Proto-Germanic. It's actually related to the plural that in English we write as S, right? Um, houses, bones, ravens. Um, the, the equivalent form in Old Norse is an R, but those both go back to a Z in Proto-Germanic that we see reflected in runic inscriptions in very early runic inscriptions in Scandinavia, England, uh, and in Gothic and German. So you could be deceived by seeing a word asir, which reflects Old Norse in say 1000, 1200, something like that AD, and a word asir from the much more ancient Etruscan and say, oh, there's a connection here. There is not. It is simply the coincidence that we see in any two languages you bring together. And I mean, that's true, like I said, of Arapaho and English, you can find things that look similar. Uh, and mean similar things. That does not mean the ligatives are closely related or related at all, potentially. Uh, I mean, once you've got enough vocabulary replacement, like I said, millennia of the hamburger problem, what does it mean to say languages are related uh, if their entire vocabulary has been replaced in that time? Uh, I'm not sure. So I hope this has given you a little bit of a perspective on uh, what we mean when we talk about proto-languages, what we mean when we talk about pre-languages, and a little bit of what goes into reconstruction. Uh, in my end screen of this video, after a little musical interlude with some looks at the mountains, I will have links to some related videos that I hope you'll check out as well. My channel is supported by donations from my generous Patreon supporters. I hope you'll consider becoming one of my Patreons. It really helps me continue to make these videos in beautiful places available for free. So for now, from beautiful Colorado, I'm wishing you all the best. <laughs>